Most people don't want to admit it, but the fabric of our civilization is fraying at the seams. In the past few years, this unraveling has accelerated. We've become more divided culturally, economically, and we used to watch sitcoms. Then somewhere in the mid-90s, people started watching reality TV. Now, all we watch is the news. One crisis after another. And another. China is facing its worst outbreak of COVID. And another. Everywhere, essentially down by and four. again, and again, and again. Christians might call it the quickening. Muslims call it the day of reckoning. But I, as a scientifically wired agnostic, just call it the age of consequences. My name's Nate, and I'm a prepper who makes YouTube videos. I'm guilty of lacking faith in our society's ability to hold it together as the consequences of our collective ignorance begin to mount. When times get bad, people call me a genius, and when times are good, I get called insane. Today I'm going to try to make a case for my sanity, and lay out in as empirical a way as possible the different reasons why we are on the brink of collapse. The 11 Nobel laureates that comprise the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists have created a metaphor called the Doomsday Clock. The closer the clock is to midnight, the more vulnerable we as human beings are to catastrophe. We are currently at 100 seconds to midnight, the closest it's ever been. Although the time on the clock is set arbitrarily, it undoubtedly represents the consensus amongst the brightest minds in the world that we are certainly on the brink of major catastrophe. It's important to note that the clock was set at 100 seconds to midnight before Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Now, in the spring of 2020, many military analysts believe that we are closer to nuclear war than we've ever been before. The scary part is, is that this is only the beginning, and as those final seconds tick away, the scope and scale of catastrophe will become magnified. There's something I call the apocalyptic triad, three primary factors that are driving the collapse of human civilization. This is comprised of conflict, climate, and contagion. All of these have the effect of amplifying the other, which creates a vicious, perpetual cycle towards societal collapse. Conflicts decrease attention to climate issues, which increases the conditions that would facilitate the emergence and threat of contagion and negative health outcomes, which lead to socio-economic instability, which further creates or increases the likelihood of conflict. This is exemplified in the current East vs. West conflict, where the need for oil and natural gas as a result of trade embargoes will likely have a negative impact on climate, which will increase the threat of contagion and poor health outcomes, which will likely lead to socioeconomic turmoil, which will, in turn, intensify the conflict. The apocalyptic triad is not exhaustive of all of the existential threats to mankind, but most catastrophic events are either a byproduct of this triad or work to reinforce it. Things like economic recessions and depressions, inflation, resource scarcity, food shortages, cybersecurity, artificial intelligence, civil unrest, biological warfare, authoritarianism, and shifts in human population, or even aging demographics and infertility, are all positively correlated with the triad, meaning that they all have a negative effect on conflict, climate, and contagion. There are, of course, also natural disaster events like solar flares, supervolcanoes, earthquakes, tsunamis, and asteroid impacts that are always going to be forces that humanity has to reckon with. But these are not the primary drivers of what scientists have called the Anthropocene extinction. On February 24th, 2022, the world changed forever. That was the day that Russia began its quote-unquote demilitarization of Ukraine. It wasn't long before everyone was talking about the potential for World War III to break out in Eastern Europe. It wasn't long after that that everyone was talking about the possibility of a nuclear war. And it wasn't long after that that the potassium iodide tablets that people take to prevent the ingestion of radiation through their thyroid gland, as well as personal protective equipment like gas masks, started to fly off the shelves. Cold War hysteria had returned with a vengeance, and for very good reason. No matter what the outcome of the conflict between Russia and Ukraine, 
This is likely the genesis of a third world war. The Iron Curtain has been rolled out once again, and a permanent dividing line between East and West has been drawn. This time, its authors are not only the Russian government, but big tech firms in the West who have deplatformed Russian media in an attempt to combat disinformation. These approaches only work to further segregate East and West. By the most astute geopolitical analyst accounts, Russian engagement with the West has been permanently severed, and this divide will only deepen as it fortifies its alliances eastward with China and other NATO adversaries. To complement these escalating tensions, countries around the world have committed to increase military spending and even military conscription. This conflict has accelerated the inevitable split between East and West that has for decades been hand-stitched together by mutually beneficial trade relations. Now in the span of weeks, all of that has rapidly unraveled. Whether it's North Korea's intercontinental ballistic missile tests, or Australia's nuclear submarine base, or even China's warning of the worst consequences for any country who supports Taiwan militarily, or even rising tensions in the Middle East between Iran and Israel, the map displayed here shows all the ongoing conflicts in the world, which will likely be key flashpoints when all hell breaks loose. Many countries who haven't yet taken a side will ultimately be forced to as sanctions against Russia mount, and anybody engaging in trade with Russia or Russia's allies may themselves be sanctioned. This has in all likelihood increased suspicions in NATO by impacted countries who will wonder if they too can be easily financially alienated at a moment's notice. They may choose to opt for some other economic safe haven knowing that they can be cut off of the US dollar at any given time. As the war wreaks economic havoc on our globalized market, the cost of living is going to increase. The growing refugee crisis may further destabilize impacted nations, leading to civil unrest and the rise of more populist and radical leadership, which may further fan the flames of the East vs. West conflagration. The most important question, however, is the nuclear one. According to a Russian military doctrine stated in 2010, nuclear weapons could be used by Russia in response to the use of nuclear or other types of weapons of mass destruction against it or its allies, and also in the case of aggression against Russia with the use of conventional weapons when the very existence of the state is threatened. Russia claims the use of nuclear weapons can be de-escalatory in nature, referencing their escalate to de-escalate nuclear strategy. In the same way that the United States dropped the Hiroshima and Nagasaki bombs to stop World War II, as dated an approach as it may be, this is the current Russian strategy. However, the most terrifying and lesser known about fact is that NATO's nuclear capabilities are far more vulnerable than people think. While the USA maintains a philosophy of strategic nuclear deterrence to prevent what the West refers to as mutually assured destruction, which is the idea that if a nuclear war to break out, nobody would win because we would all be destroyed. However, Russia remains poised and on a permanent nuclear alert, espousing the opposite view that a nuclear war is not only survivable, but very winnable, and it has in recent years been preparing its forces for that eventuality. According to Dr. Peter Vincent Pry, who is the executive director of the Task Force on National and Homeland Security, were a nuclear war to ensue today, NATO and its allies would likely lose due to Russia's unabashed state of nuclear readiness, their emphasis on intercontinental ballistic missiles over obsolete strategic bombers and intermediate range missiles, ICBM capable nuclear submarines and electromagnetic pulse and hypersonic weapons there's a distinct possibility that America would be caught off guard before they were able to stage a substantial counterattack. What's more is that Russia maintains a culture of preparedness, with hundreds if not thousands of underground bunkers, some of these are deep underground military bunkers that are outfitted with provisions to supply tens of thousands of people. In addition to that, Russia's technological philosophy, according to Vladimir Putin himself, is that all equipment, hardware, and communications of the nuclear forces and control systems are regularly upgraded yet remain as simple and reliable as a Kalashnikov rifle. In an attempt to match this state of readiness and modernize its forces, the USA has pledged $634 billion over the next 10 years. But at the rate things are progressing, will that be too late? 
Now, it's very important to know that the current edition of the Russian military nuclear doctrine, when compared to that of the national security strategy that was outlined in 1993, significantly lowers the threshold under which the use of nuclear weapons is permitted. For example, in 1993, the doctrine only allowed the first use of nuclear weapons when the existence of the Russian Federation was threatened. However, more modern versions explicitly state that Russia reserves the right to use nuclear weapons to respond to all weapons of mass destruction attacks on Russia and its allies. In light of the current circumstances that have Russia buckling under the weight of global condemnation and economic pressure, the prospect of nuclear war is higher than it's ever been in history, as Russia may feel its own sovereignty is under existential threat. While nuclear war would be hell on earth and have dire consequences for billions of people around the world, the scary part is, some not only think it's survivable, but also winnable. In a last ditch act of desperation, the green light might be given as the elites head for their bunkers and the rest of us have to deal with the fallout. Unfortunately, however, as we're going to discuss in the next section, nuclear war may well be the least of our problems as a species. According to a study on the intensity and frequency of extreme novel epidemics, the risk of intense pathogenic outbreaks is growing rapidly. The rate at which novel pathogens like COVID-19 have broken loose in human populations in the past 50 years is increasing dramatically, and this study estimates that the probability of novel disease outbreaks will likely increase threefold over the next few decades. Consider that in just the last 20 years alone, we've seen the emergence of three different highly dangerous coronavirus pathogens, that is SARS, MERS, and SARS-CoV-2. Interestingly, they also calculated that the probability of a pandemic that's capable of eliminating all human life on Earth was statistically likely within the next 12,000 years. Now, while 12,000 years may not be something you in your individual life care to lose sleep over, consider that even a pandemic with a modest 10% kill rate could totally upend civilization. This past pandemic had a fatality rate of somewhere between 1 and 3%. Just imagine what a 10% fatality rate might look like in terms of the socioeconomic devastation it would cause. Even our best efforts couldn't contain the most recent pandemic from circulating the globe many times over for the past two years, even with medical interventions. Now, part of the reason that outbreaks are becoming more frequent are things like population growth, increased urbanization, meaning that you have more and more people living in smaller and smaller spaces changes in our food distribution system, environmental degradation, antibiotic resistance, and more frequent contact between humans and disease-harboring animals. Not counting globalization. Just look at this flight map on flightradar.com. 100 years ago, this degree of interconnectedness did not exist. Now, a virus can spread around the world very rapidly before we can even detect it. According to the Center for Global Development, based on historical data on epidemic frequency and geographic distribution, they indicate that the frequency and severity of spillover infectious diseases, that is, zoonotic diseases like SARS-CoV-2 spilling over from animals into humans, is steadily increasing, as shown in this graph here. Now, while viruses do tend to evolve to be less lethal over time, a study by the Scientific Advisory Group for Emergencies found that there is a realistic probability that a MERS-like strain of COVID could emerge with a much higher fatality rate. Consider that the fatality rate of MERS is estimated to be between 20 and 35%. The researchers said that the recombination of two variants of concern or interest could potentially lead to this type of reaction warning that the likelihood of this happening given the current circumstances of this virus was a very realistic possibility. Now there is some good news. There are some protective factors, one of which is our new found germophobic culture. If there's one good thing that COVID did, it was prime us for more lethal pandemics by getting the population accustomed to things like social distancing, lockdowns, using touchless technology, and even the use of personal protective equipment although there is some debate on the effectiveness of some people's PPE. Unfortunately, governments around the world and their stammered response to the pandemic inadvertently triggered civil unrest on a scale that we've never before seen in some countries. 
The way in which the government dealt with the situation was a contentious issue for some, and this had the effect of further polarizing populations that were already divided along political, cultural, and economic lines. And think about it, if we were forced indoors again, how much could our already battered economy sustain before collapsing entirely? Although lockdowns may be effective, they're also not sustainable in the long run. And this pandemic has had lasting negative economic repercussions to this day, the root cause of which remain unaddressed, like the logistics of our global supply chain and the incapacity of our healthcare system. It's likely that if another pandemic were to happen soon, it could exacerbate these current socioeconomic issues to the point of total collapse. But war and even pandemics may not be the worst of our problems. According to a University of Utah scientist, Tim Garrett, civilization is a heat engine that consumes energy and does work in the form of economic production, which then spurs it to consume even more energy. All human activity generates heat in our burning of fossil fuels. There are natural sources of atmospheric carbon dioxide, things like the outgassing from the ocean, decomposing vegetation and other biomass, even venting volcanoes, naturally occurring wildfires, or even belches from ruminant animals. However, these natural sources of carbon dioxide are offset by something called carbon sinks. Things like photosynthesis by plants, or absorption into the ocean, or into the creation of soil and peat. However, human-induced carbon, methane, and other greenhouse gas emissions, although small in proportion, are additive and cumulative and thus are not naturally absorbed by carbon sinks. And this is the reason why we are at a disequilibrium with nature. A disequilibrium which will inevitably lead to our destruction. Now according to Tim Garrett, in order to stabilize our emissions, not even reduce them, we have to switch to a non-carbonized energy source at a rate of about 2.1% per year. That would mean we'd have to build at least one nuclear power plant per day every year just to stabilize our emissions. The problem is, even if we were to do something now, the warming that we are seeing today is the result of carbon emissions over a decade ago because of the lag in CO2-induced warming. Because of the current war in Europe and the widening east-west geopolitical divide, it has become increasingly less likely that any sort of collective action that addresses this crisis will happen in the foreseeable future. The sheer amount of environmental issues that we are facing are staggering. Coastal regions are becoming wetter and more prone to intense storms and floods. Consider that last year on Canada's west coast, it experienced one of its driest summers ever, which was followed by one of the worst flooding events in British Columbia's history. Interior regions of continents are becoming drier in what is being referred to as one of the worst droughts in 1200 years in southwest North America. This is having a drastic impact on agricultural output. The Arctic sea ice is rapidly melting to the tune of almost 90% has melted in the last 50 years. And this is problematic due to something called the latent heat of fusion of water. You see, sea ice not only reflects the sunlight back into outer space, thereby cooling the planet and limiting the amount of heating in the oceans, it also acts like an ice cube does in a glass of water. Once that ice cube melts, the temperature of the water rapidly increases as shown in this graph here. Since human industrialization over 150 years ago, global average temperatures have increased one to two degrees. Now, while that might not seem like a lot, Consider that all that is required for a total ice age is a 4 degree drop in temperature. We are currently on pace to vastly exceed the 2 degree mark in the not so distant future. This is evidenced in the most recent IPCC report, which is one of the most dire reports to date, which basically states that we are fast approaching the point of no return. The change in temperatures, particularly in the Arctic, are causing abnormal jet stream patterns, which lead to erratic weather and natural disasters. For example, in Lytton, BC, in Canada, it recorded its highest temperature ever at around 50 degrees Celsius. Unfortunately, not too long after that, the town was enveloped by forest fire. Forest fire activity has reached near apocalyptic proportions with more intense blazes burning closer to human populations every year, and this is projected to continue in the future. 
Water scarcity is becoming more frequent around the world, impacting almost 40% of the world's inhabitants, and this has the potential to increase conflict among nations, as well as civil wars. There's the issue of depleting aquifers as a result of mismanaged mass agriculture. There's also the issue of what's called the Anthropocene extinction, or species extinction as a result of human activity. For example, almost 40% of insect species are in drastic decline, in part due to the overuse of pesticides. This is having drastic and dire repercussions on the food chain. There's the issue of topsoil erosion, overfishing, monoculture, blight, antibiotic resistance in livestock, and even just the ethical perils of factory farming as a whole. The fact is, no matter how you slice it, from an environmental standpoint, we are screwed as a species. And the only hedge against the inevitable food and water shortages is going to be horticulture and building your own self-sufficient lifestyle. Please check out our wide range of preparedness related videos with the blue strip along the left side as shown here in order to gain more insights on how you can become more self-reliant and prepare yourself to endure the age of consequences. Don't forget to like, comment, subscribe if you found this video insightful or enjoyable. Thanks for watching Canadian Prepper Out. The best way to support this channel is to support yourself by gearing up at CanadianPreparedness.com, where you'll find high quality survival gear at the best prices, no junk and no gimmicks. Use discount code PREPPINGGEAR for 10% off. Don't forget, the strong survive, but the prepared thrive. Stay safe.